Well, our next speaker um, is Sarah Richardson. We've known Sarah for a long time. Uh, she received, received a BS in biology from the University of Maryland in uh, 2004, enrolled in the Human uh, Genetics PhD program at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Medicine in 2005. She was awarded a Department of Energy Computational Science graduate fellowship in 07 and was a fellow until 2011. Her research at Hopkins focused on algorithms for the design of synthetic uh, nucleotide sequences and the engineering of a synthetic yeast genome. Sarah joined the DOE Joint uh, Genome Institute on March 2012 as a distinguished postdoctoral fellow in genomics to work on massive scale synthetic bio biology problems. She's currently working on improving uh, JGI's host engineering capabilities in the application of novel genome editing uh, technologies. So we're really pleased uh, to have her back. It's nice to see her again. And we look forward to her talk. Thank you. I love coming to this conference. I love hearing about all the science and the excited scientists doing science that I otherwise wouldn't get to hear. Um, this picture is of me writing a bacteria. I was really disappointed, you guys, to find out that there is no job title germ wrangler. I really wanted to be a bacterial wrangler. And so what I'm going to talk about today is the next best thing. I work at the Joint Genome Institute. It is the best environmental sequencing center in the world. And one of the reasons for that, it is a Department of Energy facility, a user facility, a national user facility. And that means the Department of Energy, our government, decided to aggregate a bunch of expertise and a bunch of material really cool robots in one place and make them available to the entire planet. As long as what they're trying to do has to do with energy, biogeochemistry, the environment, we will help them get their science done. And that means I get to work on problems that other people have that will benefit the entire planet, but I also have access to their data and I get to work on the best machines in the world with the smartest people in the world. And that is a real engine for doing good science. So, but what we're mainly interested in, because we're Department of Energy and not NIH, is the environment. So prokaryotes and plants are the big constituents of things coming through our sequencing pipeline. The top picture is some of our sequencing line. We have a lot of sequencers in the bottom of all the computationalists, the informaticists, all of the experimental scientists who make JGI such a great place to do research. So what I'm going to talk about is really powered by JGI. <sighs> This is a beautiful picture of the tree of life. I'm not going to pick on Ernst Haeckel, but uh, he really affected the way we think about biology and genealogy. He drew this beautiful tree, and he put man at the top and bacteria at the bottom. And there might be some bacteria that are cool with that. They like not having to worry about things and being low on the totem pole. But it's not really a good representation of how life is set up on this planet or where the diversity is. It might give you the impression that we're more evolved. And I hear people say that you know we're the pinnacle of evolution. It's this fallacy, the idea that evolution has a direction and that we're winning. Um, this is a more modern tree of life. It's better laid out, but still, humans are over here at the end. You know, we look like we're very far along. It's still biased. This is a biased tree. And most of the tree is spent on eukaryotes, birds, reptiles, amphibians. This might give you the impression that we represent most of the biomass on the planet and most of the diversity. And I'm sure we feel very smug and on top of the food chain in our air-conditioned supermarkets. But if we continue to make the planet less habitable than it already is, it's not going to be us making it. It's going to be the five times 10 to the 30 bacteria on the planet. The, the, the biomass of the bacteria, as we predict it on this planet, is equal to the biomass of all the plants. That's the same amount of carbon is in all the single-celled organisms as it is in all the plants on the planet. And they exist everywhere we've ever looked for bacteria. We have found them. And if we don't find them the first time, when we go back and look again, we find them. And that includes inside you, inside all the eukaryotes. You might hear, oh, ants, insects have a big biomass. If you squeeze an ant, bacteria pop out, full of bacteria. Five pounds of you are bacteria. 90% of the cells that make up your body are not human cells. 
So you are a walking ecosystem. The biomass on this planet is incredibly tied up in bacteria. Charts like this don't even begin to cover it. So this is a better representation. It's a little harder to swallow. This one is not built on any kind of distance, you know, man at the top and bacteria at the bottom uh, in terms of time, but in terms of DNA. And here, the length of the lines is telling you how many changes to the ribosomal genes in these organisms have occurred. And that's a really good measure of distance, actually, because we all have ribosomes. Every single form of life that we know about has ribosomes. Here at the end, I guess, there's us. And this is a mushroom. This is corn. And you can see we're closer to this mushroom than this bacteria is to that bacteria. It's like comparing giraffes and blue whales. We tend to think of bacteria as this kind of monolith, right? They're, just, they're single-celled organisms, they're bacteria. It's all good, we know how to handle them, we know how to fight them. It, it's a whole other world down there. It's a whole other world. Um, one of the reasons we really want to know is because what we all have in common is DNA, and we're all just as evolved as each other. The bacteria have been around just as long as we have. But I like to think of Earth as a massively parallel computation. And the calculation we're running is how can a cell survive in any arbitrary environment? And we've gotten good. We, our strategy was to get together, form tissues, specialize organs, walk around, move, change our environment with our hands. Bacteria's response was a little different. That we're going to go to the bottom of the sea, and we're going to learn how to live in a thermal vent. We're going to go to the glacier. We're going to be there. We're going to learn how to survive there. The answer to every challenge that Earth has ever thrown at a life form, it's in this tree. It's written in the DNA. If you need to learn how to turn sunlight into sugar, one of these organisms figured it out and left the answer in its DNA. If you need to learn how to oxidize this chemical or reduce that chemical, one of these organisms knows, and it put it, the answer in DNA. Our DNA doesn't have all those answers, but the DNA of all these bacteria, it does. That's part of why I went to the JGI. We are librarians of DNA. The whole world is a cookbook. Bacteria and plants, they have figured out a lot of stuff. And chemically, computationally, we are not yet as good at figuring out this stuff as 3.6 billion years of this massively parallel computation has been. So that's my computational science, is evolution. <laughs> so one of the big problems that bacteria and we have in common and that we are very comfortable with the idea of asking bacteria for help on is a very ancient problem, obnoxious neighbors. Bacteria have this problem, we have this problem, it's the same thing. You're just going along, using up your resources, and somebody else horns in and tries to take them, and you really want them to go away. So you have an obnoxious neighbor, you want them to go away. It's the same for bacteria as it is for us when they move into our gut and we get sick. The answer is, if your bacteria, is, sorry, if your neighbor is a bacteria, you want an antibiotic. And we're used to going to look into bacteria to figure out how to make antibiotics. The top left, erythromycin, you might have heard of it. It's an antibiotic that comes out of the bacteria Saccharopolysporia erythrea. Nystatin is an antifungal for when your neighbors are fungus. And this is made by a bacteria called Streptomyces norsiae. They want to kill fungus for some reason. They figured out how. They wrote down the answer in their DNA. All we have to do is read the DNA and see this in there and try and make it. Unfortunately for us, those two things, we haven't been able to get anything else to make it. We have to grow them in these bacteria. So we found the answer in the bacteria, but it's stuck there for now. Artemisinin is a really interesting story. That's an antiprotozoan. It's an anti-malarial drug. A plant makes that. For some reason, some point in history, a plant had a reason to kill malaria or something similar to malaria, and it wrote the answer in its DNA, and it's still doing it. Avermectin is an anti-helminitic, parasitic worms. I do not have any clue why this bacteria needed to kill worms or what it needed to do with this drug, but the drug ends up killing worms, so that's great for us. These are all drugs that we use today. These are all in use. Well, aside from neighbor killing, there's other interesting things that they do. This abilene is a precursor to biodiesel. It's actually a really good form of biodiesel. It's got a low cloud point, a low freezing point, so if you can make it in plants, you could maybe potentially grow your biodiesel, just sun, shine, sun the, uh, shine the sun on it. You know, anything that you can get a plant to make is essentially a sun-powered process. It's solar-powered biodiesel. Lovastatin lowers cholesterol. Oyster mushrooms make that. They found it in oyster mushrooms. 
Epithylone is an anti-cancer drug. Interestingly, it comes out of a bacteria that's a swarming soil bacteria. That bacteria uses it to tell its members, whoa, slow down, don't grow so much. And it turns out it works on some cancer cells. We call these things, these chemical solutions that 3.6 years of, 3.6 billion years of evolution have put into the DNA on the planet, we call these natural products. And when we go looking for them, it's one of JGI's missions, is to take all the massive amounts of data that we get in and look for these things because they're really important. It's really, really important that we find them. Um, we find out that bacteria and plants make a lot of them. They make an improbably large amount of their genome. They, they donate to the making of these natural products. These are three Frankia genomes. Frankia is a very important bacteria that uh, colonizes plant roots, and I'll talk about that later. But if it, you can see the gray bars around the circle, the circle represents one genome of the strain. This is one genome of that strain. And they've marked all the natural product clusters that are in this genome. This is a lot of DNA for a bacteria to be donating to something. And the interesting part is we have no idea what these are. They're different in each one of these three gene, uh, strains. And we don't know what natural products they're making. But we know we want to know. They could be really useful. They could be anti-cancer drugs. They could be new antibiotics. But for some reason, we can't get these bacteria to show us. If we sample them in the soil, we might catch a glimpse. But when we bring them into the lab and cultivate them, they don't make it. There's a disconnect between what we know bacteria and plants can do and what we can get them to do in the lab. Some of it is because we're really bad at growing bacteria in the lab. And there's some theories as to why that is. This is a theory some of my colleagues at JGI have. This, this uh, along this axis is the number of organisms that we know about. And along this axis is a measure of uh, phylogenetic diversity, how different the things we know about are. This is the known world for us in bacteria. Most of the bacteria on the planet, we can't cultivate. Most of it, we have never even tried to cultivate. So these, and most of it, we haven't even sequenced. We've just gotten sequences from it. So this blue part is just genomes that we have sequenced for bacteria. It's really, really small. But there's so many natural products in there already. It's amazing. We can't even imagine how many are going to be in here. This, they label the explored. And these have been cultivated, but not sequenced. They might be close, they might be far, but we just haven't gotten together the muscle to go ahead and sequence them. Then you have this unexplored. We've kind of sensed these. We've put out sensors and we can tell that they're there, but we can't grow them. And it could be because they're dormant. They need to be woken up. It turns out bacteria have uh, pheromones, so they kind of go to sleep. And if you just take a sample and try and grow them, they don't necessarily get the pheromone that they wanted to wake up, and they don't wake up. And that's a really recent discovery. So it might be we need to form, brew some coffee for them. And that's literally the topic, uh, the title of a project I suggested, where we figure out what to put in this coffee to wake up bacteria. So you can tell that there are bacteria in, say, desert sands. They're not actively dividing. They're waiting for a signal to wake up. But on top of that, you have the, the undiscovered. And it's possible that knowing what we've sequenced and cultivated and kind of sensed has biased us. We use DNA markers to kind of sense bacteria in soil and in water, but it's possible that there are bacteria that are so different from what we know that our sensors, which are necessarily biased, can't even detect them. So we expect that the biomass of bacteria and the niches we'll find them in is even greater than we already know it is. But this is the problem for natural products. We can't even grow most of the things that we know exist. We, we can't. So there are some solutions for this. There's ways to get around it. One of them was synthetic biology. People were really excited about this. Now I don't need to have access to the bacteria that's making that natural product. JGI will give me the gene sequence. And then JGI now will write that gene sequence for me into something that I can grow in the lab. This was really exciting. Um, synthetic biology, you might hear a lot of different definitions for it. Um, it depends on who you ask what they'll tell you. But you asked me, so I'm going to tell you. Synthetic biology is not a field. It's a tool. It's a technique. It is a technique for writing DNA. That's it. That's all it is. And uh, what we're particularly good at is designing and chemically synthesizing DNA that then has to be implanted into a host. And we can do that in human cells. We can do it in mice. We can do it in plants. We can do it in yeast. We can do it in E. coli. And that's about it. So synthetic biology is really cool, but it's still not necessarily addressing that question of how do we get into those bacteria that are 
doing interesting things. But we have had some successes. This is the most famous success. I think it's really a flagship success for synthetic biology. Uh, the anti-malarial drug, as I mentioned, artemisinin, is made in plant sweet wormwood, Artemisia annua. And the history of the drug is a volatile one. When you have uh, no demand for it, the farmers don't plant it. And then you don't have any when there is a demand, and the price goes up, and the farmers plant a lot of it, and then the market crashes. It's very volatile. It's expensive. You have to water the plants. You have to have sun. You have to have the right kind of arable land. You have to say, I'm not going to grow food here. I'm going to grow this med medicinal crop. Uh, it was really cultivated a lot in China. It was hard to find out about it first. They didn't want to share it. Uh, it's just a very volatile, very expensive, but very critical drug. And Jay Kiesling at the National Lab and at J Bay figured out with his team how to take the genes out of Artemisia annua and with a great labor. This was very difficult. He put them into baker's yeast. The Saccharomyces cerevisiae that you know is the beer and bread yeast that you all have used in your kitchens maybe. He put the genes from this plant into the yeast here and he managed to make a precursor to artemisinin called artemisinic acid that would actually, the yeast would export it. So you could grow the yeast in fermentation and then kind of shake the artemisinic acid loose. And then with a pretty simple uh, process after it left the cell, turn it directly into the anti-malarial drug artemisinin. And this is world changing because now you can grow this anti-malarial drug in a fermenter. You can grow it rain or shine. You can grow it anywhere in the world that you can set up a fermenter. And he's managed to drop the price of this drug under a dollar. I think his goal is 25 cents a dose. And because Jay Kiesling is a great man, and part of the reason I wanted to go to the National Lab at Berkeley, he said, this technology I'm going to license to industry, but they must always make this drug at cost. They can use the platform I have made to make anything else they want, but Artemis Nin must always be offered at cost. This is synthetic biology for me. This is domestication. This is what I wanted to do. You want to change the world. Unfortunately, for every 99 attempts to do this sort of thing, to take the genes out of one organism and put them in another, 99 of them fail and one works. And when it works, it works kind of weedy. It doesn't, it's not very strong. It's not a very good output. This is a real success story. It's really rare. It's really rare. And labs are trying and trying and trying to do this, to take the genes and write them into a host organism and it's just not working. Part of the problem is because we're using the wrong host organisms. I've told you, bacteria, we can't really grow all of them. So uh, the bacteria we're familiar with, like Streptomyces, which is making a lot of those antibiotics and anti-helminths, if you're trying to make a new antibiotic and you put it into Streptomyces and it came from Streptomyces, you, you'll probably get it. But for everything else, we go read all of the, uh, these neat bacteria that we can cultivate or bacteria that we can't even cultivate and we get these natural products and we put them in E. coli because that's the bacteria we're familiar with. And it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. We put it in yeast then, and maybe it works a little better. We have yeast, and we have E. coli, and we have Streptomyces, and we have five times 10 to the 30 bacteria out there that are not yeast, E. coli, and Streptomyces. Streptomyces is famous for making antibiotics, and E. coli is famous for making us sick. When I put it that way, it doesn't seem like such a great choice for this, but this is where we are. This is the analogy I used to explain it to my fellow scientists, and to anybody really, I think this makes a lot of sense. We are hunters, we are bioprospectors, and we go out looking, at, especially at JGI, we go out looking for all this interesting natural products and this interesting genetic diversity, and we take our trusty sidekick, our hunting dog, our tool, E. coli. That is our E. coli. He's gonna help us do this, all right? He's loyal, he's friendly. We have spent 70 years making sure that he's really good with DNA, so if we shoot something, he'll go get it. And uh, we're out there and we see this really cool organism. It's got this really cool function. We can see how useful this would be. It eats grass and makes milk. We're totally excited. This is, this is great. We're gonna turn grass into milk. We're gonna make a lot of money. We have two options. The first option is to go lasso a couple of them, take them home, build a stable, put them in a pen, start to tame them, start to breed them, start to domesticate them. It's gonna be hard. It's gonna take a long time. It takes a long time to domesticate animals and we're gonna get fucked. It's gonna be really hard. That's the domestication route. The route that my fellow synthetic biologists and microbiologists are taking is the other route. You could teach your dog to eat grass and make milk. And you know, your dog is a loyal buddy. He's gonna try. You can shove all the genes you want in E. coli. It's gonna try. Some of them are gonna kill him. Some of them aren't gonna do anything. Some of them are just not gonna work. But you know, he's gonna eat grass and he might even make a little milk, but I wouldn't drink it. So, 
this is where we are at the field right now, is we have this paradigm of synthetic biology, but we really only have E. coli to do it. So this, this is a challenge that we're, I'm starting to address. Domestication. I think it's a really good paradigm for synthetic biologists especially to embrace because it implies safety. We're all very familiar with agricultural domestication because that's the biggest success story in the history of biology is domestic domestication for food. So I don't know if you knew, but every single one of these plants is the same species. So wild mustard looks like this out in the wild because there's no selection on it except for it to survive, to put its seeds in the next generation. But if you start breeding ones with pronounced stems, you get kohlrabi. If you start breeding the ones with pronounced leaves, you get kale, et cetera. The cabbage family is all basically one thing. This is the power of domestication. Domestication is a very blunt tool for editing DNA. And we're good at that. We've been good at that for a long time since we first domesticated the dog. The traits of domesticity, what we think of a domesticated organism being, I say they chew their cud. Containment, utility, docility, and safety. That they don't live without humans. If I leave my golden retriever in the backyard, he's not gonna start catching squirrels and like make a new life for himself. He's useless without humans. He's well contained. And you can see how that would be a really good model to start taking into this domestication of bacteria and synthetic biology. He's useful. I mean, he's a companion. Maybe he'll go fetch a duck for me if I kill a duck. He, he has a use. He was, he was built for a use. He's docile. He's amenable. He's trainable. I can teach him not to jump on the bed or jump on people. These are all traits of the domestic animal. But most of all, he's safe. He does not harm livestock, he does not harm people. If you don't meet all these criteria, you might not be domesticated. And if we haven't put these changes in your DNA, you're not domesticated, you're just tame. Just tame, and so we don't want tame things, we want domestic things. Like I said, big success. We, it took maybe, I'm not sure when it started or when it ended, but we're still tweaking their DNA, 33,000 years to go from the wolf to my dopey golden retriever. Uh, corn used to look like this. Uh, we've taken the cyanide out of almonds, made them from bitter to sweet, so they don't kill you when you eat them. Don't eat almonds you find in the wild. And we've actually started making things that are just aesthetically pleasing. I don't think anybody wants to eat goldfish. I'm not sure what you say are other than being pretty, but this is also a form of domestication. So the question is, what about bacteria? We've had a really good track record of domesticating for agriculture. And the synthetic biology thing is kind of slow. Uh, basically, it requires that you be able to actually grow your organism. So what about the microorganisms we can grow? Can we kind of merge synthetic biology and domestication? Well, maybe. I would say the only domesticated microorganism on this list is really E. coli, because we actively go and edit it directly. This other stuff is kind of an accident. We found out that if you take some of the old milk and put it in this fresh milk, you get yogurt, you get cheese. We are starting to cultivate Streptococcus thermophilus and the cheese-making bacteria. The same for pickles, the same for MSG. MSG, all the MSG on the planet is made in one bacteria that they've started to select to make a lot of MSG and to be really easy to grow. But we're not so sure what's happening with these bacteria. We haven't paid as much attention to them as we paid to the dog and the cow. So JGI is really good at sequencing these things and being able to say, hey, these are the traits of domesticity. When you started Growing E. coli, you took away its immune system. I'm going to talk about bacterial immune systems. And that is a trait of domesticity in bacteria. You take away its immune system, you take away its ability to stop you from editing it. Now that JGI has told us that through sequencing, maybe we can use synthesis to advance the agenda of domestication. So we can use sequencing like a jeweler's loop and synthetic biology like a scalpel. One of the first things we have to do is get better at growing bacteria. I told you we can grow very few of them. This is just a close phylogenetic tree of bacteria that we have sequenced, and I've highlighted the bacteria that have any kind of genetic toolkit at all. That is, we can grow them, and maybe we can put a plasmid in them. And the fact is, most people, most high school students, most researchers, they just use E. coli. So that branch of the tree is actually pretty well fleshed out because we sequence a lot of E. coli, we get really close to E. coli. Over here, the red one across from it, actinobacteria, is actually also really fleshed out because this is where the antibiotics, we first found antibiotics in here. And the rest of it is very sparse. I don't have a single model bacteria for epsilon proteobacteria. They're really interesting things, but I don't have any tools for them. 
So I know I sound really negative. I'm like, oh, lots of challenges and no answers. We're going to start talking about the answers. I started thinking about being able to domesticate and edit microorganisms when I got to grad school. And they said, hey, let's build a synthetic yeast. And the truth is there weren't any tools at the time to do this efficiently. So we decided to do it brute force, kind of like domestication, just throw them together. And we're going to print, we're going to chemically make every single base of every single chromosome in the yeast genome. That's 12 million bases, 16 chromosomes. Because we wanted to make so many changes, we said the easiest way to do it is just going to be to rewrite its entire genome. That is one way to domesticate something. I don't recommend it. We're still not done. We've gotten uh, two science papers so far. Sorry, this is a science paper. That's a nature paper. Uh, this one, the first totally synthetic functional designer synthetic chromosome, came out this year. It's on the smallest chromosome, 300,000 base pairs, so 0.3 million out of 12. And all of these people are undergraduates that when we started this project, uh, people didn't believe we could do it. So the only way we could get the science done was to teach undergrads and use the lab fees they paid to buy the DNA and then teach them to assemble it. So they all got a science paper. Now it's an international effort. We have groups in China and the UK. We have groups in India. And I took a chromosome with me to JGI. And we're all working on it together. But oh my god, it's going so slow. It's fine. We're going to do it. Like, that's part of what national labs are good for, is really applying the muscle and being in it for the long haul. Like, oh. When I finished my PhD, I said, we got to find a faster way to do this. <laughs> this, is, this is not going to be sustainable. Uh, luckily, uh, I picked a bacteria and I started working on it. I realized I just didn't have the toolkit for it. But luckily, there was this amazing discovery right about the time I was ready to give up <laughs> on my bacteria. And it was partially uh, powered by things JGI had discovered. It turns out for uh, 70 years or so, we've been seeing these weird repeats in DNA. So these black bars are the exact same sequence of DNA. And they just repeat it over and over. And they're really easy to spot in sequencing data. They stick out like a sore thumb. They're called uh, uh, clustered regularly interspersed palindromic repeats, or CRISPRs. And we've seen them in every bacteria. Like 60% uh, of bacteria on the planet have them. Most of the archaea have them. No idea what they did. Turns out they're an adaptive immune system. This is one more blow for that idea that bacteria are not as evolved as we are. They have an adaptive immune system that works slightly better than ours in the sense that when they get an immunity to a phage, they can pass it to their daughter cells. So whatever viruses your parents got immune to, you are not immune to. But the bacteria are immune to it. So it's basically a, uh, an adaptive immune system. And this is something we found from sequencing bacteria. And now I'm going to use it to domesticate bacteria. And I'll tell you how. The way it works is that a virus attacks a cell and inserts its DNA. And some of these genes recognize a certain little motif, just a couple of base pairs in the virus DNA, and they cut it up. And they take that little piece of the virus DNA, and they insert it into the CRISPR at the 5 prime end. It's a first in, last out sort of thing. So everything at this end of the CRISPR is newer than everything at that end. So you can actually look at bacteria and kind of get a history of their interactions with phage by looking at their CRISPRs. So now the bacteria has a little piece of virus it wrote into its own genome to remember what this virus looked like. Then this DNA is turned into RNA and processed, and you get these little nuggets of heat-seeking information. So the bacteria makes a protein called Cas9, and it takes that little nugget, and it searches for invader DNA. And if it finds it and it's next to the original sequence, it cuts it up. It interferes with the virus. So the viruses are motivated to change, because if they have a, if they have a sequence in here, it's really hard for them to kill a, a bacteria, so they change. And then the bacteria says, well, this is new, and it adds a new one. So this, this ongoing arms race, just like the antibiotics, just like the antifungals, we are just starting to realize this millennia-long war <laughs> that is going on under the microscopes. And all of these tools are just in their arsenal. So I said, how could I use this tool now to advance my science? Well, the eukaryotic people beat me to it. They were very excited, because it's very hard to edit human cells and things, or, or yeast cells. But there's a lot of papers, and they just kind of throw linear DNA, and they just throw some RNA in. And they say, hey, 1% of the time that I do this, I can edit a mouse embryo. That's really good for them. They're really excited. That's not good enough for me. And it didn't work in bacteria. It didn't, this did not work in bacteria. And I thought, that is too strange. 
why does this bacterial immune system work in eukaryotes when you put it in human cells suddenly you can start editing they've actually managed to in a cell line cure sickle cell anemia with this method we are at the fr this is the frontier of stuff right here they are editing things they never could edit before with this system that came out of bacteria go bacteria but it didn't work in the bacteria well it turns out bacteria can't repair themselves from double stranded breaks so when this this uh, enzyme is targeted at them they just die so I had to figure out a way to be able to cut the bacterial DNA to make edits, but also to save them from it. So this is how it works. I give the bacteria an autoimmune disease. I say, you are now allergic to your own DNA sequence. That's my least favorite gene, YLFG, your least favorite gene. I'm gonna make you allergic to that in your own genome. I'm gonna give you an autoimmune disease. And basically, I, I give you a CRISPR that I have targeted at yourself. So now you're allergic to yourself and you're going to die <laughs> unless you take this template that I have written that basically says how to fix yourself. And if you do that, you can survive. And this works really well in E. coli, and we're starting to get it to work in some of these other bacteria that don't have good genetic toolkits. We're starting to actually take this system that came from bacteria and use it against them. <laughs> So I, that's ha exactly how I describe it. I give them an autoimmune disease, and then I give them an option. You can die, or you can change in a way that benefits both of us. You win because you don't die, and I win because I get 90% of the cells I want having the allele I want without selection. I don't have to use antibiotics to do this. That's how efficient the system is, because bacteria really hate phage. I'm just using it against them. So here's the plan for bacterial domestication. I'm gonna, I want to hit you guys with some future science, so I don't want to get too bogged down in the details. But this is what we need to do. Is your bacteria cultivable in the laboratory? Most of the time, no. So we have to make it cultivable. We have to figure out how to wake it up. We have to figure out if it needs other things. Bac uh, biologists are kind of married to pure culture. They like to say, OK, I have a culture of E. coli, and every single cell in there started from one cell. But maybe we need to get comfortable with growing them in mixed culture. Maybe they'll be happier that way. Somebody specializes in pulling nitrogen out of the air, and somebody specializes in pulling carbon out of the air, and they get along better together. If we limit ourselves to only growing things in pure culture, we're probably going to have a hard time getting at all these bacteria. Two, is the bacteria transformable? Can I get DNA into it? If not, can we make it transformable? Does it have a CRISPR system? If it has a CRISPR system, it has a working immune system. And when I try to put DNA in, it destroys the DNA I'm putting in. Now that we know that, if it has its own CRISPR system, I can give it its own autoimmune disease and kind of tell it, knock your CRISPR system out. This is what we did to E. coli probably about 50 years ago, and we didn't even notice. We domesticated it that way. We turned off its immune system without even noticing. We just noticed, oh, you know, suddenly it's a lot easier to transform. But now that we know that and we know how it works, we should be able to apply that to new bacteria. Does it have a genetic toolkit? Can I put DNA into a plasmid? Does it have viruses? You know, can I manipulate it? If not, can I build one? Can I add a CRISPR system? If it kind of has a toolkit, can I make it more efficient? And if all of these things are true, it's ready to edit and it's domesticated. And so my goal is to make this circle include more than just E. coli. That's where we're going with it. So that in the future, instead of this mess, where you just throw everything you've got at E. coli and maybe 1% of the things you put in it actually produce anything, we can start growing really exotic, cool stuff. You guys, there's bacteria that make their own magnets. They make magnets. I'm not going to put those genes into E. coli. <laughs> that is never going to work. If I want the magnets out of that bacteria, I'm going to have to bring that one into the lab myself. What can we do in the future beyond even natural products? Well, like I said, bacteria live inside you. They help keep you safe. They make vitamins for you. They help you digest things. They prevent other bacteria from colonizing your skin. They do the same thing for plants. They live in the roots, and they pull nitrogen out of the air and give it to the plants so the plants can grow. This is a mixed community. It's just like your gut, except for the plant is kind of on the outside, right? It's inside out. So if I can start editing bacteria, if I can start domesticating them, maybe I can start helping plants fix nitrogen. Some of the plants that are in sparser soil or don't have as good buddy sh partnerships with nitrogen, I'm sorry, with uh, bacteria, I can up the nitrogen fixation in their bacteria I could make them stop looking like this and start looking like this. And then you can stop fertilizing. You can stop putting nitrogen onto the soil and letting it wash off and cause all these downstream effects. 
maybe even if I get good enough at domesticating bacteria and switch to domesticating plants, I can teach the plants to pull the nitrogen out of the air themselves. Maybe. I think it would be better to leave the that to the bacteria. 3.6 billion years of evolution can't be wrong. This one is a favorite. Uh, when I first got to JGI, they were working on uh, figuring out what the stomach bacteria of sheep looked like, and they put this picture up, and I said, is that sheep in a fart box? And I thought it was really funny, but I guess they were look used to looking at it, so all the humor had bled out of it for them, but that sheep is in a fart box. <laughs> they, they put a sheep in a fart box, and they, feed, and they measure how much methane comes out of it, and, it and they thought they were going to find that these sheep that were sibling sheep that had always been in the same place and eaten the same thing, they thought that they were going to find that they had been colonized by different bacteria, and that's why some sheep fart a lot and destroy the atmosphere, and some sheep don't fart a lot. And they want to be able to kind of figure out what they can do, maybe give them an antibiotic or something to switch the high farting sheep to the low farting sheep. And they were shocked to find that they're colonized by the same bacteria. It's not a difference. What it is is what the bacteria are doing. And so it would be nice to be able to get at those bacteria and maybe edit them so that whatever they're doing, they stop doing. They slow down or they turn something else on. And then the sheep that fart a lot become sheep that don't fart a lot. That would be really good for the planet. Um, really good for you, the human microbiome. What if I could take a bacteria out of your stomach, specific for you, and tell it to make vitamin D for you so you can get away with being an internet shut-in? And I put it back in your stomach, and it stays there with you as long as you say take a supplement because I'm all about domestication and containment. And uh, when you're done taking the supplement and your vitamin D levels back up, you know, we can recolonize you with your original bacteria, no harm, no foul. What if I could, if I could grow these things, if I could domesticate them, if I could get them to work with us instead of just on us? What could we do? And that's, that's my dream. I want to I wanna be a bacteria wrangler. And I'm really lucky to be a CSGF alum and a Lawrence Berkeley National Lab postdoc because I'm getting to live this dream. And I'm really excited about this project and, and getting going on it. And so I'd like to thank everyone at, I've got a real good luck with things starting with J. JGI, J Bay, all my uh, graduate school <laughs> people start with J. All these people are really helpful, really supportive, and of course, all of you and the CSGF Fellowship, which I was really honored and flattered to receive, and which has been so helpful. So, to all you new fellows, talk to everybody here, and you guys are going to have a great career, I know it. So, thank you very much.